All right, how's everybody doing? Just what comes up here. So I come from a mechanical engineering background, so uh, cloud computing, I had to look at the definition uh, <laughs> to see what the nuances were, uh, right, in terms of, you know, what could be considered cloud computing. So I'm way off topic here. Hopefully uh, you can get me back on track. Um, but, but my talk today is called, I'm going to turn this thing on, uh, Lowest Cost Hardware Design and Manufacturing Enabled by a Cloud-Based Infrastructure. Uh, my name is Chris McCoy, and we start these talks, as it sounds, with why, right? Why care? Um, so I'm going to pull a little example out of a book by some of my colleagues at MIT called Product Design and uh, Development, right? And in that book, on page five, they have these five products. Uh, how many of you recognize all or most of those products? Hopefully. Probably bid on some, probably use some, etc. How much do you think it costs to produce that product, something you all know and love, uh, at scale uh, in commercialization? Any, any guesses how much that might cost in Two time? Bucks. How much? Two bucks. Sorry, the development cost. Yes, the, the price of the part is, is about three dollars, but the cost to develop, the engineering costs, uh, manufacturing costs, etc. A million. Okay, a million dollars. Thank you for that. I've got gifts for people who provide answers. <laughs> 50 million for that one. I heard 50 million? No, five. Five million. Five million. 50K for the other one. 50K, all right. So we've got between 50K and, and five million? 200K. 200K. Uh, we have a one dollar bob kind of thing. Uh, so it's about $300,000. So if you add up the development costs and the production investment, um, you have uh, you have about $300,000, right? And so that to me is problematic because I love, and I would argue I'm obsessed with the process of designing and building hardware, and I just believe that, that the modern technology today can, can get us there. So for those of you who, uh, who answered questions, I think I heard your name first. I'm giving you the best money you'll ever get, and you'll see what this is. So I heard a, what was the five million back there? There you go. Uh, somebody in the 50,000, that gentleman in the back, if I've forgotten you, just grab one up before, before you go. But uh, nevertheless, so there's a whole bunch of reasons to care because I just truly believe that, uh, you know, people, the innate, the ability to, or innate desire to want to build things. But economically, uh, U.S. metals manufacturing is a $12 trillion market annually, right? Our U.S. Uh, debt is $22 trillion. So in two years, we do the same amount of metal manufacturing. So um, there's a lot of money being made in manufacturing, and then in terms of digital manufacturing, which we're focused, there's about six billion dollars currently in the market that's being addressed by that. So lots of room to grow and to take over. The social side is that that building is innately in part of our human nature, right? How many of you ever built something physical in your life? Okay. How many of you have ever thought about taking whatever that thing was and move it into commercialization? No. A couple. All right. So we got a couple. So those of you who put your hands down, why did you stop? Was there no market need, cost, know-how? It wasn't good enough. <laughs> wasn't good enough, okay, fair enough. Yeah, how do you get a prototype to, to be something better, right? Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that today. Um, and I just argue that 100K plus is just inaccessible for people really to sort of take a bet on themselves and build things. Uh, sustainability, right, uh, designing globally, making locally, that's something that cloud can uh, really help and also uh, if you design hardware correctly, you could really start to improve those things. And then lastly, um, again, this personal pitch is that I could not do this company. It's just my background in mechanical engineering and my desire to help people grow, build businesses, right? So this is the best wedge you'll ever get. If you didn't know what it was, it's just a keychain thing so that you can fix wobbly tables at bars or coffee shops. <laughs> that's, ever, that's ever happened to you. Um, that's what it's there for. It's just a, obviously marketing gimmick swag. So, but that's not why I created a company to build stupid products like that. I built products to help people like this K through 12 teacher who basically created a Parkinson's hardware device to help people get walk correctly with, with their device on a K through 12 salary, which we all know as teachers, like we don't get paid that well. And then lastly, with digital laser cutting, you can actually make boxes scalably and, and distributively. So this person was able to commemorate his lost partner who died of cancer, right? So this is a whole broad spectrum of like one-off gifts to uh, potentially medical devices that can be enabled by technologies that we are building at our company. Um, so who am I? So back in 2010, so to speak, I created a product known as the Buddy Gripper. It's a stupid product here. Again, a lot of stupid products, but 
this one led to where we are today. But this allows you to take a selfie on your on your smartphone, right? Stupid little product, but it stopped me from, I was doing product development on needing to get access to 3D printers. And so from that whole process, I created, a, like learning how to build a product, I created a course on market experimentation. And that then got taught at IE Business School, which then created a bunch of people saying, hey Chris, I have an idea, but I don't know how to build this. I don't know how to build this. So then we created the company u 3 d and from there, I came back to Berkeley, started teaching these principles uh, for, for business, uh, prototyping for business, and then most recently embedded our sort of design philosophy into MIT's additive manufacturing for innovative production and design um, globally online. It's a certificate program. And that's me in the middle riding the motorcycle beating my friend. But it's really to show my commitment to speed, competition, and winning. Um, so anyway, that's why uh, I think uh, hopefully I can add some, some perspective on this, this industry. But how it works is that simply people upload a photo, a napkin sketch, something that broke, onto our marketplace. Uh, that could be anywhere in the world, just let's say the West Coast. Then some engineer around the world who's registered their services can come in, do the design work, and that could be anywhere in the world. And then we try to we work with our marketplace full of fabricators, digital fabricators, who can take that design file and manufacture it local to the customer, right? Ultimately reducing costs in terms of shipping and logistics, uh, lead times, and so forth, right? Uh, but also, as we'll talk about, increased ca capacity and other things, right? So here's another example. Uh, looks like this is a research lab, wants to, to have an eyewash trophy. Somebody designs it uh, to help people remember to fix the eyewash thing, and then there it is, 3D printed local to the client in Michigan, right? Again, this whole design globally, make locally philosophy. <laughs> but how the heck do we do this, right? And, and, and you know, um, why is this important, right? If you look at some of the uh, the sort of notable hardware manufacturer, hardware companies, right? Jawbone, Enjoy, Juicero. Uh, if you add all of that, the investment dollars up for these dead, now dead companies, there's over 1.4 billion dollars lost in poor decision making uh, in terms of hardware design, right? So this is like this whole the idea that. Uh, Design casts a huge shadow on manufacturing. So if you don't design it right, if you don't start with the right foundation, you're gonna pay a lot of money in making mistakes. So how do we get to where we are today? How, how are we a company that survived beyond the you know, six years or whatever as a startup um, bootstrapped? I'd say having the right team has been essential for us. Uh, bootstrapping, I also believe fundamentally it's the right thing to do if you, you know, build your business scalably and sustainably, you can, you can ultimately win. Um, that also drove us to be more clever and creative and using cloud technologies to really amplify our capability with, the, with a very lean team. Um, great determination are also part of that. And then, you know, it, you know an addiction and obsession. Right? I mentioned that I was pretty much addicted to this challenge. Uh, but all those things are on the side. We're gonna talk about cloud computing. How, how do we use cloud computing? So just what do we do exactly? We have designers and fabricators who do design engineering, prototype manufacturing, production manufacturing, and project management, all uh, through uh, our services, right? Um, but we are able to do this at a lower cost because we can expand capability and capacity by finding the people, the right person to do the right job, right? How many of you, the most folks, the folks who built something, use like garage tools, right? Like hammers, nails, wood, saws. So great, awesome. Now, if you had a laser fiber CO2 laser, could you do more advanced artwork, more advanced tools? Absolutely. And with a marketplace approach and opening this up to the internet, you can find those people who can do that work for you, right? So that's kind of the idea here. For example, you can see a 3D printer on the East Coast of the United States ready to do work for somebody. And 90% of the time, that machine's sitting idle or dormant, right? So again, this whole philosophy of designing globally, making locally has sort of driven our sort of core philosophy of how we pick the right tools to, to do things, right? So uh, in our marketplace, we have obviously engineering expertise and uh, engineering experience. And if, does anybody want to volunteer what they were making over here? What was it that you made that you didn't think was good enough maybe, what was it? Uh, I made a, um, the partners in the startup, we made a, a broadcast unit that you could plunk down in any room and it would broadcast to all the other rooms in there. Very cool, so we've got broadcast units, some electrical engineering, some hardware engineering, industrial design, what have you, and I would imagine Constructing your team was probably difficult to find the best person to do the, the right job at the right time was difficult uh, It was a lot of garage hours at night late at night it was, yeah. Right and, <laughs> and so late at night individual people, but imagine if 
that this gentleman had access to more people who could do specific broadcasting design engineering, right? So again, with this sort of marketplace approach and, and, and the internet and the cloud-based approach, we're able to pull in these capacities and these capabilities that you wouldn't otherwise have and you wouldn't otherwise need uh, for the entire development time, right? Um, and then once you get into manufacturing, right, you have prototype manufacturing, which is low volume, you know, kind of rough edges is the parts that I passed around. And then and as you move into production, that's when no changes can be made. Uh, otherwise, you'll be paying a lot of money. So again, we inextricably link design and manufacturing. And that's obviously saving time, money, and, and your reputational costs, right, if you, you know, spend a lot of money and then fail. Uh, and if you don't believe me, you can believe Carl Bass, who's the former CEO of Autodesk. He said the holy grail of hardware product development is the integration of design and manufacturing. And they, he, he made Fusion 360 the flagship product. So anyway, we could talk about sort of engineering grade cloud tools, but since not everybody in here probably is building hardware products, we'll save that for another day. I just want to walk you through what our clients more or less see when they get to our website and how they can post their projects. But this one I thought was relevant because we're here at Berkeley Skydeck. This is like a Go Bears, like lawn stake sign. Um, and effectively, this was ready for fabrication, didn't need any design work, but we sort of orient the client through a web-based you know, infrastructure, and then there's a process that helps people uh, manage the design and, and manufacturing, right? But like I said earlier, I'm a mechanical engineer, not a software person, and so our user interface and website is absolutely terrible. Um, it's, you can try it, it's just not very easy to use. So, we've had to come up with other ways to serve our clients and do the stuff that we love, which is the engineering work, right? And so I sort of broke down our high-level cloud computing architecture with, it, with our respect to our front-end, back-end engineering, and then business operations. And I'm gonna focus on the two, on the front-end and the business operations, figuring that most of you, and whatever you're doing, probably have a website that you need to sort of optimize and also your business operations. Everybody is running a business these days. So this is sort of our front-end, sort of cloud infrastructure and it kind of comes from like where we get our clients, you know, how we automate the onboarding conversations, how we track them, follow up, make sure payments are being made to all of our designers and fabricators, and then uh, the payment processes, the gateways, and ways that we actually bring in the money, right? And so, this, by the way, this talk is all available online so you can download this at your leisure. So I'm just going to walk you through some of the nuanced things that we do to, again, very lean team of like basically two people, right? Um, and so here's an Instagram post that we posted this afternoon, right? On, and, and just on Instagram, thanks to if this then that. Has anybody ever used this if this then that? A couple of you. It will automatically post to our other social media accounts so that I don't have to do work and, and double, you know, how long does it take to tweet, right? It's a couple of minutes, but that's it, right? So anyway, um, if this then that. So again, out, inbound marketing uh, uh, sort of strategies. Calendly, anybody ever use Calendly? For automation. Okay, we got the camera person back there, a couple others. Again, with a quick sort of hyperlink, we can get people to schedule a meeting and you know get that reserved for them. We get some information about them and then it's it's put in our calendar. Now, part of the, the talk request was to, to note pitfalls. So does anybody see the pitfall with this particular meeting? What date does it say? Thursday, November 28th. Anybody busy on the 28th? <laughs> Right, uh, hopefully the family. So anyway, we have to block out our things and, and you have to watch out for those sorts of sub situations. So make sure your holiday calendars are locked off. Um, Bitly is another tool that we use that's again in the cloud. Uh, how many of you ever use Bitly links for analytics? Okay, a few of you. Um, memorable, customizable, and I would say analytics. And I put the plus there so that that way you know if you ever see encounter a Bitly link anywhere else out there, you can put a plus on the end and you can see how many people view it. Um, we use these to help our clients get to a, a Google Doc working document so that they can coordinate the development efforts, right? This is actually the, the customer in Michigan showing us some of the issues that they had with their prototypes, um, just because otherwise the Google Docs link is pretty difficult to understand. Um, and here's all the data, how much they're using the document, how much they're referring to it, so that we know the value that we're creating for our clients with respect to the documentation plus the, uh, the actual product development. Um, but again, watch out for um, a couple things. Uh, the once your bit link is set, it's set, you can't really undo it, and then it's, it's case sensitive. Um, so I showed you that marketplace earlier, and I told you that also that my web development skills are terrible, so the user experience is terrible. Uh, but maybe I'm being hard on myself, but nevertheless, that's a problem for your business, right? If people aren't using your software, um, so how you know knowing that we're a bootstrap team and we couldn't really expand 
and hire more software people, how could we use other tools in our suite to, to, to make product development happen? And so we used a very rich uh, Google document to sort of manage our product, um, our project management and also product documentation. And I was kind of honored to hear that a former Harvard developer that used to work with Steve Jobs and Johnny Hyde told me, he said, this is one of the best uh, levels of product documentation I've seen in the industry, which is kind of cool. It's for us, it's our project management, how we get paid, so that our clients can know how much they're getting billed every month and you know what we're working on, and so they can hit the brakes if they don't think we're doing our work. But I'd just say that, you know, how many of you use Google Docs today? Okay, great. How many of you use some of the richer features like the automated table of contents and hyperlinking? A couple of you. I would encourage it because it allows for navigation, putting things in the footer or the header so that you can quickly go right back to different parts of the document using the header tags. Makes this, this management of this document and documentation in general much, much easier. Um, just watch out for copy pasting formatting, especially if you're leveraging another client document because if you copy paste it and delete it in a new client document, they can go backwards in the history and see whatever you were doing in that last client work. So that's a, that's a, that's a security concern there. <laughs> Maybe some of you know how to avoid that. You can tell me later. Um, <coughs> payments. Who likes to get paid when they uh, do their business, right? Okay, hopefully you should all be raising your hands. Um, so we use QuickBooks Online for our accounting and bookkeeping, but they didn't have an automated recurring invoices feature at the time, so we invested some money in FreshBooks. And if you haven't used that, it's great in terms of like automating your payments in that regard. Um, very easy to do and it really hassles people to pay their bills. Uh, it will actually though very much bill people on their credit cards or what have you. So if you ended services and you forgot to disable it, uh, they'll probably get a little bit upset with you. Keep that in mind. Any questions so far? Is this interesting for people? Hopefully, hopefully this is a little bit easier to, to digest than some of the other technical stuff. But now we're looking at the business ops, right? Like we were just talking about front end, how we uh, attract and uh, charge our clients. How many of you use a CRM tool? A few of you. Um, anyway, you, anyway, any of you use a streak? Streak, no, one? You like it? Yeah, it's all right, right? So it's an integrated CRM tool right into, right into Gmail. It's got a pipeline for all your leads uh, and how you're gonna follow up with them, all the different gates and the stages and everything that you have to get through to land the sale. It has a bunch of analytics too and just for fun I just showed the email that Bill Allison sent me to you know, offer to, to give a talk today. And you can see that I was in transit uh, coming here to, uh, to deliver the talk on 1126. So you can keep all those things in there. Your deal, the deal size was invaluable, right? Uh, anyway, you can track all these things in, in, your, in your CRM. Uh, DocuSign, how many of you use DocuSign for forms? Great, so you all get that. How many of you that raise your hand use PowerForms? No power forms. So power forms are great because you can link to them from anywhere and somebody can fill them out. Your tax preparer probably does this for you uh, if you have one. So we have a, an NDA, it's a, it's a unilateral, unilateral NDA that everybody's always asking us to sign NDAs. So look, please sign our NDA. It just makes things everything easier. And when they can just go to a DocuSign and punch through a few fields, it makes our life extremely easy. And how many of you have ever redlined a document before or had your lawyers do it? Cheap process? Yeah? No? Um, so if you can get people to sign your NDA, that's great. And so this needing to make it easier for them will make it easier for you. So anyway, I really like DocuSign and PowerForms for that. And to link it on our homepage has been great. Um, how many of you use Dropbox? OK. How many of you use Dropbox to do scanning or link sharing? Sometimes. It's integral for us, especially as we start doing like uh, accounts and receipts and things like that and, and scanning documents, but I find that's been a very valuable added feature. And the copy link. So I told you about the Bitly uh, link earlier. Um, we really use that link to sort of link to a number of different files that we share with our clients. And it's, it helps a lot in terms of just streamlining the communication, right? The picture worth a thousand words. Bitly links just have really tremendously helped us understand what content that we're hyperlinking to is valuable. The last uh, sort of thing I'd warn you about is if you're ever uploading a lot of images, it starts to go haywire if you have over like 20,000 photos in your camera roll. So that's that. So I just wanted to say that that's the cloud uh, infrastructure that have, we've used to create what we now call hardware as a service or Haas. Not by coincidence they teach at the Haas School of Business. Um, and again, uh, it's just a Again, product of management, 
uh, design and prototyping service like it, you would have with your cell phone. So I'm hoping that if you folks have questions about any of these tools, uh, I'm happy to answer any of those. And uh, hopefully you're also interested in potentially investing in yourself and building a hardware product sometime soon. So anyway, with that, we are good on time, hopefully. All right, cool. Thank you. Questions? whatsoever. Yeah, please. Well, when I thought built stuff just <clears throat> kind of as a hobby, I found that a lot of times the design was sort of, um, it, it occurred at the same time I was building it. So I'd try something and then have to change something. And so I'm wondering if you've got people uploading things and someone else doing a design, does mm -hmm. that sort of break that interactive um, feature of the design process? It's a great question, and, and that's why we do our best to link them. Now, if you do have two people in two different places in the world, there's a little bit of time delay, but at the same time, if you're, you know, it really depends on the type of tool, but yeah, we, we, we bundle the service that we can keep people who are in the design roles and the prototyping roles in the same place. We love to find people who have design skills and fabrication skills all together, but as you get closer and closer to production, people sort of, they really draw a clear line between the design and the you know GD&T drawings versus production parts. But that's why we also believe that the more you can make yourself, it, it informs your design process, right? Um, so, so yeah, that's a great point, and, and we sort of create teams that can sort of do all that as best we can. Uh, there's always there's always limitations, but then we try to use those moments to have people in different time zones, so that when somebody's done with the design, they upload it. Somebody can make it the next day. And then over overnight, right? And then you can get the iteration speed much faster that way. Yeah. Yes, please. So you mentioned using some some very open free free tools like Google Docs. <coughs> Do you have any concern uh, with using that for business purposes that they're mining it? Uh, they're mining they're mining your your performance. Well, I'm sure they're taking data it's on me. It's not a matter of privacy. It's you you sit you agree. No, no, yeah, I'm sure I've signed away my life somehow to them. I do pay for the Google Suite services, so I don't know if that uh, provides any other layer of protection. I do know that as you get more and more IP sensitive with other organizations, they, they can't use Google Docs as much. Um, so far, it hasn't seemed to be a limitation for us. Maybe one of you can tell us uh, where, where we're, where we're, you know, have blind spots there or weaknesses or vulnerabilities. But overall, it's been very secure for us and seems to be working fine. I mean, I can't imagine that Google could sell a product to that many millions of people without, uh, you know, if it was being compromised. So I, mean, I guess I'm maybe just trusting that other people also we're all in the same boat together. So we would all go down to Google headquarters and wreak havoc. The question is, what are we all agree to? Yeah, what happened? That's a great question. Any lawyers in the room? That no? <laughs> yeah, please. I question of, I really believe that that's the 3D printing of the future. You do or do not? I believe. Oh, you believe, okay. Uh, what I'm wondering is that, now it wasn't clear for me, are you aiming at unique uh, designs or actually <coughs> you are aiming at something that would be mass production capable? So the show asked a great question and because we do design and manufacturing, depending on what our client's goals are, we can tailor the services to that specific purpose. Now, some of you are R&D, other people are just doing a quick market experiment on a, on a potential new business. Um, so they wouldn't necessarily need to design with production in mind. But we have a number of clients that are, are looking to do production, right? And there are additive manufacturing uh, technologies today that are getting closer and closer to production. One of those is the HP's multi-jet fusion, which is a subset of the selective laser sintering of, of powders. Um, and so, you know, depending on how you build your design, you can make it parametric, customizable, personalizable, and have these sort of nice features that could be very specific and, and enabled by additive manufacturing, not just, you know, um, you know, not just the, uh, oh, we're gonna 3D print it because it makes sense. It's, it's like you're 3D printing because it's the only tool that can do it. Right? Or it's because, well, you know, when you use it in prototyping. So most people think of 3D printing as like a prototyping tool. Many, many companies are focused on it for long-term production use. If you talk to the leadership at HP, they're planning to deliver manufacturing outcomes. Like they want to replace all the plastic injection molding machines with their HP 4200 and 5200 machines. So that's just one partner that we work with um, with respect to production additive. But there's a number of ways to skin a cat, right? So it depends on how you want to 
sell, what kind of quality you need, things like that. Yeah, please. Can your company service the design of a microfluidics device? Okay, so we're not outsourcing PhD theses here, but uh, I would say we're not as good on those micro scales. Uh, luckily, some of our leadership has knowledge in microfluidics through semiconductor fabrication processes. Um, I would argue that we could definitely be a, uh, a value in the sense of you know printing your objects bigger, just so you can see them, touch them, feel them. Um, obviously, the, the the scaling of forces at that scale are are different and require special expertise. But we could source those people through our our marketplace, right? If you could find the person who's not me and doesn't, that knows a lot more about microfluidics than maybe somebody else, right? So, so we can help, but uh, you know, there and there are some technologies I could I could point you towards, but you'd have to tell me if they were going to make your limits or not. Because what are you talking about? Like feature size on tens of microns? Uh, something on the size like that you fit on like the back of a mouse. I'm, I'm involved in aging research on campus, and okay. so I want to start with uh, sampling the hormone profile for. Um, mice or maybe rats cool. it's a little bit bigger and uh, we want to use that information to hopefully uh, slow or reverse aging process in humans. Well let's talk because there's definitely technologies on additive that are on the smaller scale and I know they've done like nano imprinting and uh, have a, they have a race car that they've created that's on like a 10 micron scale so it's doable it's just maybe very expensive. Time for any more? Is that it? Yeah I think that's it. Uh, let's give it a hand to cool. all of us. Thank you.